Hi everyone, it's Vincent. I hope you guys are all safe and healthy. This is a part of a two-part video for starvation and exercise. I'll be covering exercise. Uh, the second half of the Vinicky TA Power Team, Nikki, will um, be covering starvation. So let's get started. All right, now here we're talking about exercise. So um, here are the general questions that you should be able to answer by the end of the video. Things to think about when you're watching the video, essentially. Um, these are very important to remember, so please keep these in mind. What happens in your body during increased muscle activity and how do these functions vary with varying intensity and duration of exercise? Make sure you remember those questions. Uh, things to be familiar with before we get started. The insulin story, signal transduction, glycolysis, glycogen metabolism, fatty acid oxidation. These things aren't super necessary for you to be able to understand what we're talking about today, but they will be able to help you make more connections with what we learned in uh, lecture so far. Cool. So now we're going to talk about skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle makes up a lot of our body mass, approximately 40%, according to your textbook. And it accounts for approximately 35% of resting metabolic activity. So why is this important? Well, this is important because skeletal muscle is the largest target for insulin. It's the signaling molecule in our body that helps regulate our glucose levels. So we find that increase in muscle activity, so exercise coupled with a balanced diet, will um, increase insulin sensitivity. And that's important because insulin sensitivity is, um, if you're sensitive to insulin, then that means that your body is able to use blood glucose a lot more efficiently than if it was, say, insulin resistant, like a type 2 diabetic would be. So with this, we can see that increased muscle activity coupled with a balanced diet is actually a great treatment for things like type 2 diabetes, as well as coronary diseases and depression, just to name a few examples. So what happens with an increase in muscle activity? Well. As we can see from the diagram right here, first what happens is we have action potentials, right? Action potentials, basically a stimulus that tells our muscle fibers to contract. So when that happens, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, basically the endoplasmic reticulum of a muscle cell releases calcium ions, right? Those calcium ions do three things. So one, they help with contraction of the muscles. They actually make the muscles contract. Um, second, they induce transcription factors, which actually code for enzymes that help with fatty acid metabolism. So let's write that one of those down there. Fatty acid metabolism. Yeah. And the last thing that calcium ions do is they, uh, do another set of transcription factors, which signals a cascade of, or has a signal cascade that increases mitochondrial biogenesis, which basically just means increasing um, mitochondrial mass. So let's write mitochondrial biogenesis. All right, so why is that important? Well, that's important because the coupling of these two things right here actually lead to a greater or more efficient fatty acid metabolism. So as we can see what I wrote here, excess fatty acids actually increase insulin resistance, whereas efficient fatty acid metabolism increases insulin sensitivity. So that's why it's important for us to be able to metabolize fatty acids efficiently because it increases our insulin sensitivity. So with that, you should be able to answer the question, what happens um, with an increase in muscle activity? So now we're going to talk about the variations due to varying intensities and durations of exercises. Okay, so we're going to talk about two separate types of exercises. First is going to be anaerobic, anaerobic, and the other is going to be aerobic, right? 
Anaerobic exercises include exercises like sprinting. We're going to say sprints here. Uh, these would be very fast and very intense um, bursts of energy, power outputs, if you will. Um, and aerobic exercises, let's call this distance, distance running. Yeah, not as intense and slower paced. Um, I like to think of that. Cool. So the energy currency of the body, as we know, is ATP. ATP is the energy currency of the body. And that directly powers a protein in our muscles called myosin. Myosin. So what myosin does is it converts chemical energy into actual movement. So myosin converts chemical energy to movement. Right, and ATP, ATP directly powers myosin, as we talked about. Um, so the variation comes with how we actually get our ATP, right? Where's the fuel? What are the fuel choices we have when it comes to getting the energy for all these different types of exercises, right? So the variation comes with fuel, fuel choice. Cool. So let's first talk about sprints, right? We're going to run 100 meters. This is the 100 meter dash. So as we can see, this is an anaerobic uh, process, an anaerobic exercise. So what are the fuel choices we have here um, that are involved in sprinting in an anaerobic um, type of exercise? We have stored ATP in the muscle. That's our first kind of source of fuel, right? ATP is already stored in our muscle. As I've written here, the second thing we have is a molecule called creatine phosphate. Now, creatine phosphate is just a molecule that stores excess phosphates and essentially um, phosphorylates ADP into more ATP, right? So that's what creatine phosphate does. The third thing we do when we're doing these anaerobic exercises, this sprint, um, is the anaerobic glycolysis of muscle glycogen. So anaerobic glycolysis of muscle glycogen. Right. This is specialized in type. 2B muscle or fast twitch muscles. What anaerobic glycolysis of muscle glycogen basically means is we're turning glycogen into lactate. As we can see from the figure that I took from the book here, uh, muscle ATP, creatine phosphate, and conversion of muscle glycogen into lactate sit up here and they are relatively faster than the other um, methods of getting ATP that we'll talk about later. So, as we can see, makes sense because sprinting requires very, very fast energy. So, that's, that explains that. So, why can't we fuel, why can't we use these fuel choices when we're running a thousand meters, right? When we increase from a hundred meters to a thousand meters. So, one of the explanations is because muscle ATP and creatine phosphate are limited. They're limited in the muscle cells. They can only last you for probably about like around 10 seconds at most. So that, that won't help, help you with a um, 1,000 meters. The second reason is because uh, by making lactate from glycogen, an increase in lactate concentration, if it gets too high, will lead to something called acidosis, which is basically um, there's too much acid in your blood. And that's no good. So how do we run a thousand meters? Let's see. Uh, medium distances. So this is this would be the a thousand meters uh, running situation. So this is an aerobic type of exercise. So a change that we're going to make from the last 
process is we're actually going to completely oxidize glycogen in the muscle, the muscle to uh, carbon dioxide. So it's, uh, as you can see on the table right here, it's this one right here. This has a pro, which basically is, this is increasing energy stability. It increases, I should say, increases energy stability. So that makes it easier for us to maintain a pace for longer. But a con of that is this is slower. So this would be a much slower pace because the rate at which we get this energy is much slower than that of uh, if we were sprinting or an anaerobic process. So now for long distances, we're going really long here. We're going a marathon, right? I've never ran a marathon before, so I don't know how that feels, but I don't think I ever want to know how that feels. So long distances uh, depend on cooperation of muscle, liver, and adipose tissue. So as we can see here in our table here, um, we have conversion of liver glycogen into CO2 and conversion of adipose tissue, uh, conversion of adipose tissue fatty acids into CO2. There you go. So all of these, these three things right here with the uh, muscle, liver, and adipose tissue, these help with long distance running. These are the fuel choices for your long distance running. So the complete oxidation of glycogen to CO2 happens in the liver as well as the muscle and the conversion of fatty acids into CO2 also happens during longer distances of running. Something to note would be ATP generates much more slowly from high capacity stores than limited ones. So high capacity stores like fatty acids, right? Those are going to generate ATP much slower than say limited ones like what we talked about with sprinting from um, ATP muscle, ATP muscle, and creatine phosphate, right? So what's actually happening here? What's actually happening in the muscle or during this marathon, right? So muscle glycogen from the skeletal muscle and the liver, so from the skeletal muscle and the liver, are completely depleted at this point, right? And when that skeletal muscle and liver glycogen is completely depleted, then that makes it so our power output, so the power we're putting out, is reduced 50%. So 50% of our power output is gone when our glycogen is completely depleted from our body, right? This is what's known as called hitting, hitting a wall. And if you're familiar with running, you should probably know or be familiar with what that means. Um, so the other 50% of your energy output would be from fatty acid oxidation, right? So the breakdown of those fatty acids. Now, we have a ton of fatty acid stores even when we're running, running a marathon, right? We still have those fatty acid stores even when we're running. The problem with that is it seems as though fatty acid oxidation really only accounts for 50% of uh, aerobic processes, so it can't really do all of it. It would have to depend on something else as well. It talks about it more in your book if you want to read about it, but we're not going to focus on that. So what happens is when your blood sugar is low, your blood sugar, when your blood sugar is low, you have a much higher glucagon insulin ratio. When that happens, we start to mobilize fatty acids from the adipose tissue into um, our muscles, right? So we would mobilize, mobilize fatty acids um, into our muscle. That would then be oxidized into acetyl-CoA and then eventually CO2. So what happens now is acetyl-CoA levels, as they tend to rise, it actually slows down or decreases the activity of pyruvate dehydrogenase, 
which basically um, stops pyruvate into making acetyl-CoA. So because of this, glucose is then inhibited. Glucose is inhibited from entering into the citric acid cycle and oxidative, I'm running out of room, entering into the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. What happens then is that spared glucose, the spared glucose right here is then stored so that we have enough energy to pick up the pace at the end of our race. So yeah, that's what that's what's happening during this long distance race that we're, we're talking about here. Some final notes that we would that I would like to uh, address is fuel utilization is only one of the many factors that determine running ability. There's a lot of other factors like how much people have actually trained. It varies between athletes. So keep in mind, fuel utilization is like only one of those factors that contribute to the running ability. Another thing, carb rich meals after glycogen depletion. So carb rich meals right after you like hit that wall restores glycogen scores really quickly. And uh, glycogen synthesis continues during the consumption of carb rich meals, which includes, which increases glycogen stores far above normal. So if you run a lot, um, carbo loading is something that you're probably familiar with. And this is what that is. You're eating a lot of carbs so that you can increase your glycogen stores uh, a lot. So you have enough glycogen stores for um, your super long distance run. So that's going to be all from me. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe uh, to be notified as quickly as possible on our videos coming up. Please watch Nikki's video on starvation. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.